All right. So good afternoon, everyone. I see that people are uh, slowly uh, joining. Uh, it's great to see um, uh, many of you joining this afternoon, uh, this morning for Francis uh, on the other side uh, of the pond. Um, I'll just, yeah, just give a one minute to let more people um, join. And then we can kick it off. All right, I'll, I'll suggest that I'll just uh, kick it off um, and I'll do an introduction as people also um, join. So good afternoon, everyone. Good morning to those that are joining uh, from the other side uh, of the Atlantic uh, to this event, to this policy dialogue, the run up uh, to the US uh, elections at Transatlantic Crossroads. Uh, for those that don't know me, uh, my name is Ricardo Borges de Castro. I'm an associate director and I lead uh, the European World uh, Program here um, at the European uh, Policy Center. And I'm really, really delighted that you are joining us today. So I want to thank you for joining us today uh, for this important uh, discussion. I think um, let's say that this, this is already also an important week. We could be discussing uh, the momentous week that we are living also. I mean, in the US, President Zelensky is, is, is going to be in Washington today. Uh, there will be a European Council at the end of the week where many of the questions probably that would be important, but we're going to actually look forward and look uh, into 2024. And 2024 is going to be really uh, an electoral year on steroids. Uh, but I think, uh, or we think, that there is uh, no other date that is going to be so um, relevant or mo more momentous than the 5th of November 2024 with the US elections, presidential elections uh, um, in, in, in the United States. And, and because the outcome of these elections could have really affect uh, the future of uh, democracy uh, in the US, but could also have Im very important ramifications for the transatlantic relationship, for European security order, I think for international relations um, uh, in general. So I think that this is really a momentous um, uh, um, you know, uh, election. And, and indeed, we have a really an excellent um, a panel to discuss these issues from different perspectives, uh, seeing it from the US, seeing it from Europe, from, also from different perspectives and also uh, generations, which is also an, an important way to sort of to, to bring home the, the relevance of um, electoral uh, moments, I believe, for all of us. So I'm delighted to be joined by Frances Burwell. She's a distinguished fellow at Europe Center uh, at the Atlantic Council, but also a senior director at McClarty Associates. Uh, Ambassador uh, Juan Valdi Almeida is the EPC senior advisor and also a visiting fellow at Trinity College in Cambridge University. And last but certainly not least, uh, Georgina Wright, uh, resident uh, senior fellow and deputy director for international studies at Institut Montaigne. So welcome and thank you also the three of you for, for joining us today. And, and before I start, let me just give some very quick uh, housekeeping uh, rules. So I'll start um, uh, the, the, the policy dialogue with a, with a broad question to the th three speakers. Uh, I will then engage in a, in a conversation uh, with them, and then I will open the floor for questions. You can do this both um, um, in the chat or you can raise your hand and I'll bring you into the conversation. What I would ask you is that you are really brief, so I can also, if the, if the questions are on the chat, I can read them um, at, at a glance. So without uh, further ado, let me just uh, move quickly into our discussion. And so I'm um, depending on 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 the outcome of the of the election on the 5th of November 2024 um I think there are two crossroads that can be open one in US domestic politics but also internationally and international relations and let me start with you Francis uh to go with the domestic sort of angle if we can put it that way and I mean what are your expectations for the campaign for the year ahead that I mean we have now about 11 months uh, to 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 the elections how do you see things evolving and and also if I can top it up with this question that is uh, that that is the easiest one is that can the American system uh, survive another four years of Mr. Trump? Can Trump 2.0 be be managed uh, from from that perspective? Uh, you have the floor, Francis. So thank you again for being with us. Well, thank you, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to be here, and uh, especially to be here with such good colleagues who are also on the panel. Um, I think that the First off, I should give a big caveat that you should not ask anyone who has spent most of their professional lives within the Beltway, the Washington DC Beltway, about what the nation is thinking. 
because uh, experts from within DC really don't know the hinterland, so to speak. Um, and so it, you will have noticed that many of our election prognosticators over the last few years have gotten things remarkably wrong. Um, so I also think that this year in particular, we are in uncharted territory, totally uncharted territory. Um, we have a series of legal cases coming. They've already started, uh, as everyone knows, uh, against Mr. Trump. Um, the expectations right now is that the current case, which is about civil fraud in New York, will wrap up in January. And there may actually be a decision by the judge. It's not a jury trial. Uh, by the end of January, early February, something like that. Um, then there is the uh, Jean Carroll um, trial again, but that's relatively small. People don't, they've heard her name before. I don't think that's going to have much impact. Um, in March, we start the federal election interference trial run by the Department of Justice. Um, then we have the classified documents case in Florida in May. And then we have the Georgia election interference case. Uh, which the prosecutors have asked to start in August, which would actually be after the Republican convention. And I would point out that Super Tuesday, which is the big primary day in the U.S. election calendar, is in early March, I think the 5th. And uh, so it's possible that none of the new case, the big new cases will have started by that time. So I'm sorry if you can hear any noise behind me uh, with the okay, dogs. We, we can hear it. It's, it's okay. It's <laughs> can okay. you hear me fine? Yeah, I can sorry hear it very that. well. Thank you. Um, so at any rate, I think that we have, nobody really knows what this means and how the electorate will respond. Clearly, there are people who will vote for Donald Trump no matter what. Um, and there are also people, though, who did vote for him in the past and who are, as they say to the reporters who go out to the country and cover these things, tired of all the drama. And I think what they're going to see over the next few months uh, after we get past the Christmas holidays is drama, drama, drama. So who knows if they will stick with him? Um, who knows? I have not seen a good legal analysis about what happens if he's convicted on uh, any of these things. It's not to his uh, eligibility to run for office and, and to be the president. Um, it also is not clear uh, what this will mean if he has to drop out of the race very quick, uh, very suddenly at the last minute. My own betting right now is that he will do very well in the Republican primaries because mostly it's the people who really uh, are his supporters who are very motivated to vote in those primaries. Um, a possible uh, wild card, I think, is Nikki Haley. Um, if he is forced to pull out at the last minute, I can see a lot of people throwing their electors, throwing their votes to her. Um, she's doing well. She's not leading. She's not second yet, but she's gaining rapidly. Um, and she has the kind of experience that I think actually could be uh, a threat to Biden. So the other side of the table is President Biden. Every indication is that he is going to stick with his pledge to run. I think the fact that we don't have any serious Democratic um, alternatives right now, we don't have anyone else gearing up to run, means the Biden team has been very firm. They've said, he's running. Don't try to raise money from anyone <laughs> for anyone else like that. So I think we will probably see either a um, Biden Trump or possibly at the last minute a switch to Haley. And if that happens, Haley, she represents kind of the Bush family division of the party, that kind of she's gone farther to the right because the party has gone farther to the right. But in foreign policy, She's really a traditionalist, a mainstream. And I think that she could bring in a lot of people who are sitting on the fence, who will vote for Biden rather than uh, Trump, but who aren't really happy about Biden. So um, my own betting is that if it's Trump, Biden, Biden will win again, uh, because um, by that time, the economy will seem better. Remember, we are almost, 
almost a year away still from the election. Um, the people who are, there's been a lot written about the divisions in the Democratic Party as a result of the Israel-Hamas conflict. But the people who are protesting Biden from the left of the Democratic Party, who are they going to go for? I mean, they don't have another option, really. Um, everyone in the Republican Party is even more staunchly in favor of Israel's right to defend itself. So uh, I think that they, the combination of um, Trump being, I think people came out in 2020 uh, to vote against Trump for Biden, not because they were in love with Joe Biden. And I think we're not at that point yet where the Democrats have said, okay, he's going to be the candidate. <laughs> we have to get serious now um, and start supporting him. And if and this will play in as well with uh, the very strong support that he and Vice President Harris in particular have given on abortion rights and LGBTQ and other things that we are seeing in the states that are um, that have had some elections, uh, some referendums, we're seeing very strong support from young voters and women uh, on those particular issues. If Trump wins, which I personally don't think will happen, but if he does, will the US system survive? Just a couple of comments on that. First, I think the Justice Department will be in real peril. This will be a much more dangerous time than it was the first time because he knows what he wants to do. And also there are not going to be any of the experienced professionals joining his cabinet or private staff because they tried that last time and most of them have ended up really on the outs with him um, and have been some of his fiercest critics. However, I do think he will be much more focused on domestic politics and ensuring that he is pardoned from whatever he may or may not have done so he will be more concerned with his own legal issues um, rather than foreign policy. So the US becomes absent. Um, it's entirely possible that he would try to take us out of NATO, uh, but his own real focus is on the, on the domestic and particularly our judicial system. And that's a, it's going to be very dangerous. All right. Well, thank you, uh, Fran, for unpacking so much. Also to give us a little bit of what are your scenarios, how you see things uh, shaping. But as you said, I mean, uh, if a week in politics is a, is a lot, almost a year, it's, if, I mean, it, you multiply that for, for many, many weeks. So, um, but I, I wanted now to follow up just quickly uh, to hear uh, João and then uh, Georgina um, on, on basically the prospect that, that uh, Fran just put on the table that it's, you know, if Trump wins, what might be some of the, let's say, global implications or international implications and particularly uh, for Europe and, and, and for the transatlantic relationship. So again, what can we expect? Can we actually, can, you know, can Europe cope with with this uh, with a with a victory uh, by Mr. Trump, and then we can also maybe in the second round um, explore a little bit also what Europe should be doing and what the Americans also should be doing in terms of of of, of maintaining the transatlantic relationship in in some sort of uh, positive direction. But João, you have the floor. Thank you again for all being with us. Well, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Good morning. Uh, listen, I I couldn't agree more with Fran about the fact that. Uh, uh, there are several Americas, several United States, many, uh, in fact, and having served as uh, ambassador in, in Washington, I know how little Washington represents uh, uh, the U.S. Uh, I, I had the opportunity to travel to uh, virtually all the 50 states, and I realized how little I knew about the U.S. And every time you travel in the U.S., you get uh, uh, awareness of your ignorance is a very complex country which can uh, elect uh, Obama and then Trump and then again put a, a Trump on top of the uh, of the, the, the opinion poll so I think we have to 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 approach this with a high degree of uh, uh, we have to be humble uh, about uh, interpreting and uh, analyzing the situation in the US but I'll say uh, uh, make a, a couple of comments the first one is to say that at any any American election is relevant for the world and relevant for Europe and relevant for the European Union. But I think this one is particularly relevant. I think it's it's the most consequential election in a number of years. 
for, for all the reasons we know, the international context that has changed immensely since uh, the, the, the last election. It's, it's very consequential for, for the West as a whole, to begin with, uh, for the EU, for NATO, for the G7 countries, uh, for the, the North Atlantic Alliance, but also for uh, the Friends of America in the Indo-Pacific region. I can think of Korea and, and Japan. Uh, they will be following this as attentively as and as worryingly as, as, as we are. The secondly, it's important for Russia and Putin, of course. It's not irrelevant what comes out of, of the 5th of November. Just imagine a, a Putin-Trump uh, uh, meeting and 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 uh, and uh, sort of complicity. Uh, uh, very very difficult to 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 envisage, of course, but the real possibility. Uh, it's very consequential for China. Uh, the two great powers that have engaged in a in in a in a consequential rivalry. Um, uh, let's see how uh, this election will impact on that. Uh, before those elections, we have the first major election in the year, the elections in Taiwan, uh, and we'll have to be attentively. The link between the two uh, is important. And last but not least, this uh, election will have consequences for the multilateral order. And, uh, and uh, we unfortunately know what one of the main candidates thinks about uh, multilateral institutions. Uh, and uh, and uh, I, I was serving in New York during the, the Trump years at the UN uh, with Nikki Ailey, uh, actually, and I know what that means. We can talk about Nikki a, a little bit later then. My second main point is to say that even if Biden wins, this is a consequential election for, uh, for all of us and for the EU in particular. Because in any case, as I, I think we will see throughout the year, the debate in the US is going in the wrong direction for European interests. It is going in the wrong direction regarding Ukraine. I've seen the polls today saying that half of the American voters think that the US is spending too much money in Ukraine. Uh, so even if Biden wins, and we know where his heart is, is on basically on the right place, he'll be under enormous pressure ahead of the election in the run up to November 5th uh, to, to address that concern. So uh, in any case, uh, regarding Ukraine, uh, this election is not bound to bring necessarily good news for Ukraine and good news for us. But take also China. Uh, you know, the debate on China in the US to a large extent is who's, who's tougher on China. Uh, and uh, I don't think the election campaign will uh, change that that much. And if it does, it's what I call the race to the top in, in terms of, of being you know, uh, uh, aggressive or assertive regarding China. Uh, you know, these two developments on Ukraine and Russia and on China uh, would put enormous pressure on the European Union, as we can imagine, a very heavy burden on us, either in terms of the support we must give Ukraine and uh, the choices which are extremely difficult for Europe regarding our attitudes toward China. So in any case, a very consequential election. Uh, my bottom line in this first uh, reaction to your question is to say I'm very worried, uh, regardless of the, of the outcome. And I'm extremely worried if the outcome is a Trump victory. Uh, thank you, João, also for laying out some of the more global uh, implications uh, of, um, of, of what you know, this election represents also the fact that, and, and this is something that uh, I'll pick up now with Georgina, the fact that what you're mentioning is really how the American political system, how Americans are thinking about these issues, irrespective of who is the president and to a certain extent shaping the way that uh, that the politics is done um, uh, in Washington, but, but not only. So, uh, and so Georgina, if I can come to you now, um, so also from your perspective, I also want you to give, you know, take uh, whatever take you would, uh, you would want to to on this first on this first um, uh, round but also i mean how can europeans actually prepare 
for this, you know, for for the fact that either with Trump or Nikki Haley or or possibly Biden, Americans are thinking differently about uh, global issues or differently from what we are thinking, or at least don't see them, uh, or we don't see eye to eye on this. And maybe even we can have an internal discussion. Are all Europeans seeing eye to eye on what are the challenges ahead? So anyway, I don't want to get into that. But uh, you know, how 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 do you see this uh, this evolving and and with the consequences also for 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 Europe? Thanks a lot. Well, thank you very much um, for the invitation. And also, I think this discussion is really timely because November, you know, is in a year's time, but it's tomorrow in terms of planning. Um, and I completely agree with everything Francis and Charles said. So I'm not going to go over all their very salient points. I think the first thing to note is, you know, EU capitals are thinking about the US election. You know, before it was a bit of a taboo, you didn't want to talk about it. You know, France would be there pushing and saying, we need to talk about the US election. And everyone else was like, no, you know, we don't, let's just wait and see. I think now there's much more internal thinking in governments about what the different scenarios look like and what the implications could be. Because I think Charles right. You know, even if Biden is re-elected, this will pose significant challenges to the EU. And, you know, he went over the e, sort of EU security in Ukraine and China and the world order. But there's also, and that's especially prescient here in Paris, um, the, the competitive challenge that the US poses to, to Europe. And I think if you look at what China and the United States are doing, they have highly interventionist industrial policies. I don't suspect Trump would massively change that if he were uh, re-elected. And, and I think this does pose real serious questions in the EU about how we maintain our comp competitiveness, you know, how we try and shape the world order, which is clearly being these sort of global trade rules are, are very clearly being undermined. I think there are very different strategies. If you look at ask different EU governments, they have very different strategies when it comes to uh, the US election. Some say we need to massively invest between now and November 2024, show the US that we're serious, uh, that we that, you know, and then we will have invested so much that it will be really difficult for the US to pull out of Europe. Um, I think, and I'm not saying that because I'm based in Paris, but I think that's quite a risky strategy. I mean, if you look at Trump, Trump is not someone who has shown particular sympathy or loyalty towards people who invest massively in the US. You know, he he has a much a very different approach. Um, if you look at the Heritage Foundation, they're the think tank, sort of the brains behind the Trump campaign. I mean, they have some really interesting stuff up there. But, you know, some of the things that I've seen is, for example, they're recruiting candidates who I think, you know, would integrate a Trump administration. They ask them things like, do you agree that the US should significantly cut its military budget? Do you agree with the statement that the US should ignore official guidance if he believes that the administration is working against or undermining his agenda? This is a very different United States. So you, I think investing massively is one approach, but I also think we as Europeans need to be much more realistic about what we can do. And perhaps I'll end on that is I was in Washington in October and um, I was speaking to a fellow think tanker who just returned from Washington last week. And the Republicans and the Democrats have very clear messages towards the EU. So I don't understand why we're not getting them. The first is they say, we're extremely disappointed in the EU. We feel like you don't do enough. Now, actually, if you look in terms of aid to Ukraine, the European aid and US aid is more or less equivalent. So why are we failing to communicate that? The second is they say, whether they're Republican or Democrat, you have a really bad discourse towards us. You all come to Washington, you say, we really need you for X, Y, and Z. What you should be saying is, we're doing all of this, so we don't need you on this, that, the X, Y, Z. We'll only need you on this tiny little bit. That is a radically different discourse that we should be having in Washington. They have been saying this for years, and still we don't seem to be uh, implementing it. And I think thirdly, and perhaps we'll come back to this, I think it poses really strategic challenges for the EU, which is, you know, we always sort of relied on the US slightly um, to kind of show us the way, you know, whether it's on Ukraine or the Balkans. But it's not entirely clear to me that we know what we want to, how we're going to continue to support Ukraine beyond 2024. Um, you know, we don't have, we say we have, we're long, we're committed long term. And I, and I hope we, I sincerely hope that that's the case. But I think we need more credible commitments in the form of acts and actions. And this is the same on EU competitiveness. Um, it's the same on China. Um, I think there are a number of things that we need to clarify as Europeans. And perhaps we can come to this later. 
I think there is a question about what we do in the EU format and what we do in the European format, because, of course, we have non-EU uh, neighbours who um, would be uh, natural allies and who I think we should grow closer to on all these big strategic questions. So I'll stop there. Well, thank you very much. I think this was brilliant because in the way that you all mapped out uh, the issues, I think there was at least a couple of points that I would like to in, in now to 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 explore uh, with the three of you. And I mean, it seems to me that um, no matter who wins, there will be issues that will be there. It, whether either it's uh, Trump or or Biden or 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 Nikki Haley, let's say, and okay, with Trump they might be you know sub substantially more difficult, but there are issues that that are there. So I think the point that I would like to ask now is that I mean, what can uh, if and if I can also you know tempt you to do that, Francis, is it what advice would you give to Europeans in how do we prepare for this? As as Georgina was saying, okay, I mean November is just tomorrow, but it at least gives us a little bit of time to prepare. So I think. In, in this this round, I'd like to ask the three. I mean, are there ways to prepare? Are there ways to set up guardrails or safeguards or whatever? How can we sort of maintain the relationship going, um, uh, knowing that there are issues that will always be on the table that uh, Americans and Europeans would need to deal, and sometimes differently. So, uh, Francis, I, I start with you again. So let me say first that I totally agree with Georgina on the messaging. Um, I know that all the M European embassies and the EU delegation here have like one pagers that say, you know, what they're contributing in terms of Ukraine, but they are having a really hard time getting that through, especially up on Capitol Hill. I would say the administration is very aware of it. Um, and it's partly due to our system, which doesn't take in information from foreigners and from, <laughs> there are many other, you know, politically, I have to say that the Republican opposition or uh, hesitation about funding for Ukraine is not driven by an evaluation of the situation in Ukraine or anything like that. It's driven by wanting to have something to um, hit the Biden administration with, to criticize the Biden administration. It has nothing to do with Ukraine. I have yet to hear one good argument of why we should not funding Ukraine from Republicans, um, other than Hunter Biden, <laughs> which I think is just, you know, part of their little mythology that they have up on the Hill. But I do think her point, Georgina's point, about coming to Washington and saying, we need you, we need you, it's so important that you stay engaged, rather than saying, we're doing all this, we need you to do X, Y, and Z to complete the circle and to make this effort really strong. But we're going to go ahead and do X, you know, LGM, whatever. Um, I think that is that is the message that we need to start hearing. And it's going to be particularly important if Trump is elected and even if Nikki Haley, uh, if any Republican is elected. Um, I think even the Biden administration, I mean, right now, for example, we have the negotiations on steel and aluminum. And the Biden administration is not going to do anything that they view as endangering their position with steel workers prior to the election. So the current betting, I think, is that we will extend the negotiations until after the election um, before we can come to a resolution. But even the Biden administration, a great friend of Europe and a staunch supporter of the transatlantic uh, uh, relationship cannot make that kind of, feels it cannot make that kind of compromise. I think Europe has to prepare itself and has to prepare itself for the United States to be absent. Um, I have seen under the von der Leyen Commission um, serious movement in that direction over the past, I'd say, two years. Uh, the focus, growing focus on economic security, etc. Um, and I think, but I think that much more needs to be done. One of the things uh, that I watch a lot is the uh, Trade and Technology Council. And I've had some colleagues suggest maybe there's a way to institutionalize that so it can continue should Trump be elected. But the reality is that if a president believes that the EU is the enemy, um, the TTC is not going to function. So I think there has to be a really... Um, hardcore, you know, a, a coming to reality 
in Europe about just how bad and difficult this is going to be, where you have the United States that is not just as in the Obama years, more interested in China than in Europe, but one that is act that is not interested in dealing with Europe at all, really, um, and may want to pull out of key uh, transatlantic institutions such as NATO. And will Europe be prepared to maintain security guarantees on its own, for example, um, with the UK? Georgina makes a very good point there, uh, and. Will they have the capacity to do that? Uh, thank you, Francis. And 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 Joao, I mean, if if you could already uh, to a certain extent uh, react to to what um, uh, um, Francis was saying, and particularly now on NATO, and also there's a question from John Palmer. Maybe we can take this already. Um, uh, that you know, Trump in a sense has criticized NATO. It's a Ponzi scheme. So. You know, potentially he could uh, withdraw. So, what would be the consequences of this, or how can Europeans prepare in in the meantime as well for such a such a such a, a possibility? Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Georgina said that member states are thinking. I I would say they have to think harder. Uh, I I don't see uh, yet a, a degree of awareness of the challenges that that will come. I, I think we need to prepare for the, for the worst case scenario like any planner, good planner would do. And the worst case scenario is Trump on steroids. The worst case scenario is Trump with the sense of revenge, you know, uh, is, is now famous quote, I want to be, what is it? I'm, I am your revenge, I will be your retribution. Uh, I mean, this kind of language uh, and he says he wants to be a dictator, but only for the first day. So God knows what will come on the first day. Uh, and uh, I, I don't think there's an alternative but to prepare for the worst case, uh, the worst case scenario. What worries me the most? I would say Ukraine, climate, and China, uh, and then uh, and then competitiveness, as uh, Georgina mentioned, the possibility of a, of a, of a, you know increased acrimony on the on the trade side with. Uh, with the United States. Uh, so that gives you at least four elements of, of concern on which we need uh, contingency, contingency plans. We need alternative, alternative tools and alternative partners. I think we need to basically work first and foremost with other G7 partners. Uh, you know, if, if, if Trump comes in and we know how uh, dismissive he was about G7 in the past, uh, not to mention NATO or EU. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, the members of the non-American members of non-US non members of the G7 need to get at, their act together. As a former ambassador in London, I, I, I want to underline the importance of our cooperation with UK. Uh, in any scenario, I'm a firm believer in a, a triangular cooperation between the EU, the UK, uh, and the United States, and for that matter, also with Canada across the Atlantic. But if if the U.S. is absent, as Fran was uh, saying, then we need to work with the others. And but uh, I think, uh, particular if another election takes place in London uh, 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 next year, uh, we will be uh, and new election in in Europe as well. So we can have by the end of twenty four, and in twenty five in particular. Uh, uh, new actors, uh, uh, new uh, uh, legitimated actors on uh, across across the, the the channel as well, and and uh, and and this is certainly an area of mutual work. My my other point is to say that in preparing for a Trump situation, we need to see we need to continue to work with the U.S. Right. So I think there are we should draw a list of a Trump compatible EU US agenda. So what can we sort of uh, stimulate or uh, convince Trump to work on with us? Uh, that's ob obviously uh, China is one of them, right? But maybe we can uh, draw a list of Trump compatible agenda with the US and start working on that, even talking to some of the people that potentially will be working with uh, with Trump. My last point is about being cautious about this uh, race to the top of, of protectionism, uh, what someone called the homeland economics. 
uh, I think there's merit in it in terms of European strength and its capabilities, but there is a downside. And the downside is an all out uh, drive towards protectionism across the Atlantic and, and beyond. And this is not good for uh, open economies like the European ones. So uh, a word of, uh, and I heard well what Georgina said about Paris. I know what Paris thinks about all these issues. And uh, UK is no longer there inside the EU to sort of balance out uh, these uh, instincts. Uh, I think we should all, uh, as, as people expressing opinions on the side, uh, points to the risks of, uh, of, uh, of an excessively uh, protectionist agenda that could easily come out of, you know, multiple reactions to uh, multiple factors and end up being very detrimental uh, to, uh, to European interests. Um, thank you, Joao. Uh, Georgina, I wanted, I wanted to allow you also to react to what uh, both um, uh, Francis and Joao have said. But, out, you know, there's also a question in the chat about uh, precisely, uh, and Joao mentioned a little bit, this triangular relationship, uh, you know, of European non-EU member states in this context or where, do you, where we, we would place them. So, I mean, in a sense, and particularly, let's say, in a scenario of Trump 2.0, that is a very aggressive uh, towards um, uh, you know, let's say the EU. Uh, how, where do you see the the UK? You know, what what role do you think that UK? As Ron said, there will be probably an, an election next year as well in the UK. So, how do you see the role there for EU UK relations? And also, I mean, I can't I can't help to ask you about France. You know, what you know, what how is France preparing uh, uh, for this? Uh, great, great questions. Um, I think on the UK, the, the first thing is, yes, there is an election uh, and it's an important election because we could see uh, a different uh, government in power and, uh, in a, you know, a party that has suggested that it wants closer links with, with the EU. But I take think taking a step back from that, if you think about why the UK and the EU have grown closer together over the past, it's undoubtedly because of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. That's what forced the UK and the EU closer together. Um, and yes, and of course, there was a change in Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, who suggested he was slightly more open to, you know, the UK joining Horizon Europe, which, which is the research program, and that happened. But fundamentally, it was the it was the geopolitical crisis, and so there's nothing. Uh, to suggest that you know if Trump were re-elected, uh, then then that that wouldn't be the case again to force them together. Um, I think there will be wariness in 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 the UK about the EU versus the rest, um, and in particular anything to do with EU security. I think there'll be a strong push for those conversations to happen within NATO first and foremost, and then of course open that space for UK EU discussions around uh, reconstruction of Ukraine. Um, and other things. And I think it will also depend on the UK's own bilateral relations with individual member states. So I think the Franco-British relationship is in a much better place than it used to be. Um, and, you know, I'm thinking of UK, sort of London, Berlin, London, Warsaw. Um, these are all going to be quite instrumental. So I think it's it's a bit too early. And, and perhaps, actually, it's, it was listening to everyone speaking, it was making me think that I'd quite like to write a paper on what that would look like, what would close in UK EU cooperation look like on these issues. But I think the finally, and I'll end on that point with the UK, the UK has a very special relationship with the US. And, you know, if you think of the Suez crisis, France and the UK drew opposite conclusions of that. The UK was, we need to become more interdependent with the US. And France was like, we need independence and uh, as much independence as possible um, and so I think it does put the UK in an uncomfortable position and you've seen if you follow the media or follow what people say they're very cautious about the US election they're very cautious about what they say I don't think that should stop uh, talking or more thinking as Strauss said uh, but I think publicly it will be it will be much more difficult for a sort of British government to come out and say what it would do versus a French government that's already been quite explicit um, in, in terms of France, I mean, it, it's very interesting. If you read France's national security strategy, which I think came out in October 2022, it's absolutely clear that the US is like one of its prime allies. Um, and, and even if you think of this confusing term of strategic autonomy, when you talk to French officials, they say it means working with our allies when we can, but being able to work alone when we can't. I think in, in, in France, they've gone a step further um, in thinking about what does it look like working as Europeans without that dependable US support. 
And the first and foremost, with regards to Ukraine and European security more broadly, it's about um, it's about defence production. It's about producing the arms that Ukraine needs and the arms that we ourselves need uh, to protect ourselves. And and you know when you talk to defence companies, they say, well, we've got governments telling us to produce more, but we've got no certainty that that investment's going to continue. So I think there's a real question about how the EU and national governments can guarantee investment long-term investment because it can't only come from the private sector to continue that those lines of production um, and then i think we also need to be thinking a step ahead uh, without undermining conventional forces but about future defense technologies technologies where china and the us do not have the advantage yet and where intra eu competition hasn't been established i'm thinking of quantum and and robotics and cyber and you know uh, artificial intelligence those sorts of places i think we really need to be working and that i don't see why the eu you know member states can't be talking about that uh, more but you know bearing in mind of course that defense industry is is predominantly very national and it's been very difficult to, to, to go beyond that. Um, and I think France will be pushing in that direction. I just end by saying, I think France knows that it's a bit difficult for it to be sort of leading the conversation about what we do in the case of US election, because there's a lot of, I think, warranted sort of skepticism around Europe being, well, we know what France wants, it wants complete independence. So I think France is going to have to show that actually it's far more nuanced. Um, and, you know, and you saw it with Macron inviting Trump for a presidential visit. You know, it's not it's not sort of black and white at all. And I think France is going to have to show that this is a conversation it can have and be aware of of the many concerns from security, defense to um, to competition as well. Um, so it will be interesting to see how that evolves. May, may, may I come in, Ricardo? On, yes, on, yes. On, on the point of. EU, UK, for Please, uh, well. obvious reason. Uh, listen, I, as much as Ukraine, and Georgina is absolutely right, as much as Ukraine was a trigger of, you know, bringing us closer together, even in the times of Boris Johnson and Liz Truss, uh, and, and even more so with Rishi Sunak, I think uh, the American elections, particularly if the worst case scenario is confirmed, will be another factor, uh, a rallying factor, uh, you know, that uh, hopefully will bring the EU and UK closer together. And uh, and if, uh, you know, I, I look forward to Georgina's paper, uh, but I think one of the points in that paper has to be how do we sort of maximize in a positive way uh, the external pressure, uh, both from Putin and Trump, uh, uh, in, in putting this relationship in the, in the higher ground. Uh, maybe a couple of other comments on, on, on the Trump effect. We've been maybe neglecting one aspect. There is an election also for, for the House of Representatives and for uh, part of the Senate. So what will the Congress look like? Uh, and that makes a lot of difference, as we know. Uh, if, if Trump uh, regains control of the Senate and confirms the control of the House, uh, uh, you know, the problem is even more serious. If it does not regain the control of Senate and why not imagine that he loses Congress? That is a totally different situation as well, with other problems for us, but maybe uh, uh, less acute in some in some other areas. So these these are the, the kind of issues that, as everybody has said, is still too early. Uh, my point remains: we need to prepare for any scenario, and we need to prepare particularly for the worst uh, case scenario. On the UK side, I think uh, uh, we should, you know. Once the, the elections are over next year, uh, look very, very hard into a forward looking agenda that takes and starts, in my view, with uh, foreign policy, security and defense. Thank you, Joao. I mean, I wanted because we know the questions now, there are several questions already in the chat. I don't know if anyone wants to come in, uh, you know, sort of and ask the question uh, live. But anyway, I'll try to there's I mean, there's three that touch upon, let's say, security. And and uh, I think in three dimensions, first, uh, again, it's the question whether uh, if the if the US pulls out um, uh, from NATO. So how what can Europeans do in terms of security and defense and more security and defense integration? Then there's one related to um, nuclear 
nuclear deterrence. Again, if we lose, let's say, the nuclear umbrella, what do Europeans do? And I think the third one has to do uh, with this, uh, military support to Ukraine. So again, if the Americans stop doing it, can the Europeans uh, maintain uh, this support? So I'll bungle this, uh, and apologies to, 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 the, to, the, to the participants that I'm bundling your questions uh, probably win one, in one, but it's, it's sort of in the same basket and sort of just some quick reactions uh, from the three of you, uh, because then we have other questions that I wanted to, to reach to in, in, in the chat. So, um, uh, Francis, do you want to go first? Sorry, getting myself up on you. I think that one of the things that Europeans do need to talk about right now is what you do with the British and French nuclear deterrence. Uh, because if Trump were to win and then to take us out of NATO, and I, it's not clear that he can just unilaterally, but um, he will certainly try. And I think there will be a need for Europe to demonstrate to Putin that there is um, a sufficient amount of nuclear deterrence left to ensure that any um, that he doesn't start moving farther to the West, uh, even casually with you know with accidental shots, et cetera, into Poland, et cetera. So I think that's something that it's a delicate issue, and I think that Europe it's time for Europe to start talking about that <clears throat> intensively. Um, I also just wanted to respond a little bit to Joao's comment about identifying a Trump-compatible agenda for the transatlantic relationship. And I think one of the other challenges with that is that Trump is not a policy animal. He does not read his briefing books and think about policy in terms of this is US interests or these are the interests of the alliance. These, the, here are the pros and cons. As we saw even in his first term, um, he is very much swayed by individuals, particularly those that he sees as strong men. Um, and he reacts and changes, reacts to policy and changes policy according to what he sees as his, the advantage for himself personally. And that is not um, a stable foundation on which to build a joint agenda uh, because it's extremely erratic, it's extremely personalistic. Um, and, it, and sometimes, you know, comments will like, Justin Trudeau at the press conference leads to major breaks in bilateral relations because uh, the president reacted so strongly to those comments. So uh, I think that that is an additional challenge that Europe will face. Thank you. Uh, let me go. Georgina, do you want to go now? And then I'll, I'll move on to Juan. So what can Europeans do? Um, maybe just on, on the nuclear point, yep. because I think more and more I hear talk about the nuclear deterrence and and of course France and, and the UK being mm -hmm. uh, the prime countries that we look at I think there are two uh two potential outcomes I mean you know no one can really substitute US nuclear deterrence um mm -hmm. it's not it's not the same the deterrence is thought differently um so I think there's going to have to be a need for a lot of clarification about what deterrence looks like in in the UK and France and I think it's a conversation for UK and France to have together but also um, as Europeans. And I think, you know, there is a risk that countries, particularly those who really feel the immediate threat of Russia and invasion, I'm thinking of Poland, for example, really start to think very differently about nuclear weapons, about having nuclear weapons. And so in, in a way, you've already seen sort of flirting across the world with and, and more nuclear proliferation, countries deeming that, that actually this is essential. And and there's information on open source. I'm not revealing anything, but that Russia does see uh, it very differently. Countries who do have a nuclear deterrent versus those who don't. Um. So, so, so I think there will be uh, um, questions from, I suspect, Poland and and, and others, uh, but also maybe even Germany. Um, I think it would have to. It would take Trump being re-elected for Germany to really mm -hmm. talk about this. Um. But but I was in Berlin for a whole week and a lot of people were asking me about nuclear deterrence. And I, you know, I'm 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 not a nuclear expert and I'm certainly not a nuclear deterrence expert. So I think um so I think those people who are are gonna be in high demand uh, soon. But I think it's something we're we're really going to have to talk about. And again, I think within the EU, but also in, in the NATO context. Thank you, Georgina as well. Well, I, I haven't been retired long enough to be able to 
comfortably talk about nu nuclear deterrence. Uh, as you know, uh, uh, any professional diplomat is, is very cautious about all these issues, particularly one representing the European Union. Uh, and, uh, but I think we, we need to be realistic about our capacity to replace the, the, the American umbrella. I think, uh, you know, sometimes I see us a, a little bit carried away by, by the whole issue of, you know, European sovereignty. Uh, uh, and I think we need to be realistic. At the same time, uh, I still believe in the American system uh, as to consider that it is in uh, America's national security interest uh, to, 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 to use that deterrence to deter uh, uh, our, our common enemies and that uh, uh, preserving uh, security in Europe is part of the American national security and interest. So I'll, I'll think I'll be a, a little bit more realistic and more cautious at the same time in addressing these issues. This being said, it, it is clear that, you know, again, as much as Putin's evasion of Ukraine, evolution in the US can only force Europe to look more seriously about, seriously about issues of foreign policy, security and defense. I think we've gone a long way in the last few years. We are not there yet as some think we are. Uh, let's be let's be realistic again about our capabilities today. Uh, I think the track is the right one. Uh, um, the worst case scenario in America would have to accelerate the pace of that trajectory on on the on the European side, definitely. But also, as I said, uh, this will be a main factor in in uh, in the rapprochement between the EU and the UK. Thank you. If I can now, uh, I mean, we still have five questions to answer. I want, I'm going to group two of them uh, from the from the from the audience, and then the other three I'd like still to do them sort of telegraphically. But let's start first with the ones that relate to trade and also to what uh, also the participants uh, speaks of um, tech regulatory wars on technology. So in a sense, a trade war. Uh, in case, I mean, that let's say, imagine again the the, the scenarios that Trump wins the, the elections. He has said that he would, in, you know, impose tariffs on, on trade. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, let's just generally, how does Europe prepare not only for this sort of a, a more uh, sort of contentious or competitive, um, uh, sort of, uh, let's say, environment between Americans and Europeans on trade, but also on technology and 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 some sort of digital policy in general. So, how can Europeans uh, manage uh, this situation? Uh, and uh, and again, uh, Fran, let's let's start with you because it's also an area that you have been following very carefully. Yeah. So I think that um, one thing we um, underemphasize sometimes is the importance of intention and atmosphere in terms of resolving trade conflicts. The U.S. and the EU um, are each other's major trading partners, and when you talk about services and digitally enabled services, it's even bigger. Um, we are inevitably going to have issues uh, with the best of intention. Uh, what we've seen with the Biden administration is that although there are certain lines that they cannot cross because of their own views on trade policy, these are not free traders, um, that they do not want to make anything bigger, more any conflict bigger than it needs to be. So a very interesting um, scenario after the IRA was after the Inflation Reduction Act was passed, where when challenged by the Europeans, President Biden basically said it had not been the intent to discriminate against EU uh, uh, goods. And so even though there has been a limited amount, given that that's his legislation, that he's been able to change. But I think that one of the other things we saw at that time was that through the TTC, not formally, but through the connections made by the TTC and, re and reinforced, we were able to see an understanding develop of what needed to happen, putting this in a dialogue uh, into effect about subsidies and also looking at the critical minerals um, agreement still under negotiation. And I think pretty much linked to the steel negotiations. Um, we were able to see some constructive steps forward. Uh, should Mr. Trump come in again, I expect that not only will he increase tariffs, but he will uh, blow up the steel negotiations and reimpose those tariffs 
leading the EU probably to uh, impose its retaliatory tariffs. Um, I don't think that in the case of future conflicts that we don't quite know yet what they might be, that there will be this process of trying to say, okay, you know, we are where we are, but we have to find a way forward because we are uh, together in this. And I think Georgina raises the issue of competitiveness. Um, I think it's right that Trump does not really care about how much EU companies invest in the United States. He cares about trade and goods. That's his view of the world. And uh, so that is going to be where we see increasing problems in the US-EU trade trading relationship uh, without any of the safeguards or ameliorating factors that we've seen in the Biden administration. Thank you, Francis. Uh, João, very briefly. Yes. Um, well, I carry a number of TTIP scars myself. So, uh, <laughs> uh, and, uh, and I don't forget them very easily. And, uh, but in fact, you know, there was some merit in TTIP and it's, it's been proven, uh, uh, you know, we may need to look into not the, 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 the format of it, but in fact, the, TT, the TTC is a, a TTIP minus. Uh, uh, construction uh, in a way, and I think we should do our utmost to preserve TTC or something similar as a framework. My my main point will be on um, on um, on what I would call the a strategic approach to trade, uh, and uh, you know if we can have a, a serious conversation with with the Trump people uh, and put this in the context of the global competitiveness discussion, particularly regarding uh, China, I think, at least I hope that we should at least try to make some progress there. And I, I'm, I'm speaking particularly about regulatory issues and regulatory wars, as was mentioned. Um, uh, and this is valid with the UK, by the way. Uh, you know, is, isn't it time to consider that on, on the regulatory front, instead of fighting each other you know, within the Atlantic alliances, uh, shouldn't we go for cooperation against our common or potentially common enemies on the regulatory front? Uh, you know, this is relatively obvious if we don't, in the Atlantic context, in the Atlantic market, uh, marketplace, uh, uh, go in the direction of of convergence rather than divergence, somebody else will profit from that. And, uh, and this was very much at the heart of the TTIP narrative and the TTIP raison d'etre. I think this should be part of our conversation with whoever occupies the White House uh, from November, as much as I think this should be a, a discussion to be held with our British friends as well. Uh, and maybe we can have a triangular conversation about that, or maybe even at the G7 level. And I know there are some discussions already on that front. So I think here, with all the caveats and difficulties that Fran has uh, 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 rightly highlighted, uh, again, I'm looking at, for Georgina's paper, uh, at a strategic approach to trade where we can uh, potentially convince some of the Trump people that this is in their interest as well. Thank you, Georgina, very briefly. And then I think we'll need to, to wrap it up with the, one of the questions that is still in the chat. I apologize to the others that I won't be able, that we won't be able to cover, including the one on Heritage Foundation, which you kindly, Georgina, put the link into, into the chat. But I think it will be a whole discussion on how to prepare for, for next year. But please go ahead. Um, I mean, I, I think everything's been said. And maybe if I could turn to, to Catherine's question in the yes, chat. Yes, let's go to that. That was uh, my last question. So why don't we start in reverse order with you, uh, Georgina? So, you know, are European elections anywhere in uh, in the U.S. mind as well, the European Parliament elections? But Georgina, go ahead and then I'll do the, the reverse order and end with Fran. Please. I mean, I feel Francis will have a more legitimate say about this than I do, but my I suspect 
her answer would be uh, most Americans don't know there's an EU election. Um, and when I was on, I think, you know, in Washington, people said, to, if, you know, only Europeans think that what Europeans say or do matters to in the US election. It, like they really don't care. I, I, I mean, what I, I think is, um, this is a strong word, so maybe, uh, maybe I'll regret saying it, but I do sometimes think we're, we're a liability to the US election. So I think this narrative question, we need to show that we're doing a lot more. We need to show that we're capable of doing a lot more without the US and that actually we only need them on these small issues. I think that might help the Washington bubble and maybe capital, but I think we should all be very realistic that what we think and what we say has very little influence about, uh, you know, and has very little influence over the way Americans vote. Um, thank you, Georgina. João, as well, the same question, European Parliament elections and how do they fare in the US? I mean, overall, the relevance of these elections for also for, ne for next year in this context. Uh, uh, again, I think we should be very humble. Uh, European elections are not even in European citizens' minds yet. How do you expect them to be in Americans' mind uh, at this point in time? I don't think they're, they're, they have a will, to be very frank, and I the personal experience of that. I think we, on the other way around, uh, what happens in the US uh, has, has quite a, a, a relevance for our debate here. And if I think of Trump uh, uh, and, uh, and the populism in America, to speak uh, in a different way, uh, a boost of or a victory by Trump, to put it this way, will be a major boost for European populism. And, and in the run up to our June elections, and by then will be at the heart of the American campaign, that debate, the positions taken by, by Trump, the quality of the debate and how much it is polluted by populist ideas in, the, in America will have an impact in our own uh, election here. So um, uh, I'm worried about that. I think it's one of the points that's been a little bit neglected is the impact of, of Trumpism in uh, European populism, and we know there is a surge in, in Europe that will potentially affect the result of the elections. And that is why, that's my last point, I think from centre-right to centre-left, European leaders and European parties should focus on what is essential to preserve and consolidate the European project. That will be the best in, uh, message we can send Washington to say Europe is serious about its own responsibility. User, Europe is assertive in continuing its model, strengthening its single market, its uh, foreign policy defense uh, capabilities, and be an adult uh, in the room when it comes to deal uh, with uh, Russia, China, or, of course, the situation in Africa, which no one mentioned here, but will have a huge impact. Uh, uh, in 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 the situation in Europe as well. Uh, thank you, Joao. Uh, Francis, please. So, uh, three quick points. One, we are seeing more attention to European elections, Netherlands, Poland, etc. And I think we will for the uh, EU parliament for the parliament elections. Um, but on the line of is it uh, is it far right or not? And so it's it's a constant testing of whether it is a an indicator of how the American public might feel about Trump. Um, secondly, I think there are some lessons, uh, although there are very few people actually watching European elections overall um, here in the U.S. I think that there are some important lessons uh, for. U.S. campaign managers, particularly those who are trying to figure out how to respond to the far right. We saw in the Dutch elections, the center-right candidate uh, kind of opened the door to saying, you know, she would work with the far right and kind of moving in that way in my, on migration and not doing well because of it. And then in Poland, we have a very different situation where the far right government has now been ousted. At least it appears they're moving in that direction. Uh, maybe even tomorrow. Um, and the last thing I'd say is that although people are not focused on elections and uh, Europe and things like that, I do think that Ukraine and support for Ukraine is going to be a big dividing line in our election. It is one of the very few foreign policy issues that where I see resonance around the countryside, you will see Ukrainian flags in places where you did not expect it. So even now, so, I mean, not it's not just the initial thing. So I do think that Ukraine is a foreign policy issue that will have legs when we go to the ballot box. 
Well, thank you, Francis, for that. Uh, it remind, remains for me to first to thank uh, all the participants uh, that joined us this afternoon for this conversation. I think it was fascinating. We covered so many, so much ground. I think we could have easily stayed for another, uh, you know, 30 minutes, 45 minutes. And I apologize, we have run over five minutes. I also want to thank you three for taking uh, time from your busy schedules to 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 be uh, spending this this hour with us, to also to to enlighten us and also to to really to. <laughs> drive in some of some of the key issues that will will be relevant uh, for the year ahead i want also to apologize to the participants that asked questions that we didn't address canada and climate but i think in the elections would only be in november uh, next year so i think there'll be more opportunities to continue this conversation in other sessions uh, so i think there will be time to discuss all uh, issues as uh, the, the, the ground as you know the election campaign also progresses in europe but also in the us and and certainly um, I want to thank everybody for participating uh, this afternoon and 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 wish you all uh, for us here in Europe a nice evening to you Francis a nice uh, day ahead and um, and uh, and and good to and hope to see you all soon thank you very much again thank you, thank you. bye bye thank you bye thanks.